It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for five years has shared with us her extensive research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative, executive, and judicial processes in America. And now, Mae Brussel. Good afternoon. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. It's Dialogue Conspiracy number 238, and the date is October the 11th, 1976. A beautiful, warm day in Carmel, California. This past week since Dialogue Conspiracy, I have made some trips and uh, visited Hartford, Connecticut with George Michael Ivica and another researcher by the name of John and Kim. They've been working on the Kennedy assassination for a long time, and we shared information. And I spoke at the University of Connecticut in stores and then went on to New York City. I saw I Have a Dream, the play on uh, Martin Luther King, excellent play. It's in New York until November. And then from Washington, D.C., for an hour where I called the Secretary of the Treasury, William Simon's office, because while I was away, a Secret Service agent for the Treasury was at my home by the name of Mr. Barnes. And I asked what he was doing there and why he didn't have an appointment and why I didn't get a letter from him. And I said I'd call back. And I've called the Treasury Department in San Francisco, and evidently my call seemed to scare them off because Mr. Barnes won't call back and the agents won't call back. So I have to pursue that and see why the Secret Service was at my home. I told Mr. Simon's secretary, I believe it probably had something to do with the Howard Hughes case, but we'll see about that next week. And I visited in Chicago with Sherman Skolnick and spoke in Tennessee. It's the first time I've been to Tennessee, Walter State University in Morristown, Tennessee, and then managed to get home, and uh, things were pretty well at home. Uh, or should I say it was more like a state of war. Um, I came home with the knowledge that my coworker, the person that I've been working with all summer on the used book, was in the hospital. He was out when I left. He had an automobile accident the Saturday before I left. Don Steiny is his name. And uh, he was taken to community hospital and had some stitches in his head. Monterey Hospital was sent home. And then he went back to community hospital for uh, spinal taps and brain tests and was to be sent home. And while I was back in New York, I heard that he had a relapse and some blood clots in his head and he was sent into an ambulance into the emergency service at Monterey Community Hospital and had some surgery on his head. And at the present time, his vision is blurred, a tunnel vision, we hope it gets better. But you can imagine how I feel about this. This is the first person that I have worked with, with the exception of Stephanie Caruana, who came to the house when we did the article on Howard Hughes for Playgirl in December of 74. But Don and I have been working every single day, all of July and all of August. We didn't take any time out. We were working night and day to get as much done on the book on Howard Hughes before the fall lectures began, before my traveling began. So this automobile crash uh, has me concerned. If those of you that have heard this program long enough can understand why. And so many things happen to people around me that uh, one begins to wonder what is conspiracy and what is coincidence. And I don't have enough information yet about the persons involved to really come to any hard conclusion. And then we'll do some work and see what happened, what was behind this, or if there was anything other than just a plain automobile accident. So that has occupied my week, the concern over that naturally, and uh, we'll just follow it day to day. I had a list of, uh, well, here comes Chuck. <laughs> Um, I had a list of about 22 different subjects I did want to talk about on Dialogue Conspiracy in the categories of murders and uh, violence on the part of the federal agencies, the United States government. And briefly, I'm just going to run down a few of these because most of the program today I'm going to spend on the SLA and Leo Chern from the International Rescue Committee, a man named Michael Casey, who was at Soledad and then joined Leo Chern with his CIA operations. And that's a complicated tale, like the Robert Hall case that I've been doing for the last few weeks. So the bulk of the time, I will go into that. But I collected the articles the week that I was away and put them into some order, and we'll get to them eventually. 
One has to do with that organization of Murder Incorporated, which is our drug enforcement agency in the CIA, working with the far-right Nazi party in Argentina and many, many killings taking place there every day and running up to the hundreds now. Anthony C. Harris, the sole witness for the prosecution of that intelligence operation in San Francisco known as the Zebra case, was shot in Oakland, and I want to go into all of these cases at length later. He's still alive, but he lived near the police department and was shot this week. Jack Anderson has a $22 million lawsuit against Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, John Mitchell, E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy. There's 19 individuals, and the important thing about that lawsuit is he'll go into the poisons that were to be put on his steering wheel, ways to kill him, and also the psychogenics, uh, something to put into his drink or water. He's a Mormon. He doesn't drink, and uh, he's going to sue them for trying to kill him and take away his right of the First Amendment to publish anything in the news that he wants. Uh, Gerald Ford has uh, a biggie on his hands, Emprise Organization, the organization that Don and I were writing about before his car accident, uh, linked to the Hughes Corporation and Mafia, have asked Gerald Ford for a pardon for uh, charges they were arrested several years ago. And because Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon are part and parcel of the whole assassination syndrome going back to the killing of John Kennedy and the cover-up of the Warren Commission, the Emprise Mafia uh, organization that was used for assassination teams has Ford against the wall, and he's being asked for a pardon. If he gives it, he's obviously covering up for the entire Mafia operation, and if he doesn't give it, they're leaking information that goes back through the whole era, so Ford will be caught in a vise in this case. Charles Grimaldi, Grimaldi is coming out with a book stating that Jimmy Hoffa and Sam Giacana were killed by the CIA. There is new evidence that the CIA withheld information about Lee Harvey Oswald, that they did consider using him as a witness, as an agent of the intelligence community, and they also uh, intended to use Marina Oswald to start the trend, in quote, as a CIA spy. These documents have been released now because of Freedom of Information Act that CBS filed. I want to talk, and I will in the future, talk about DINA, D-I-N-A, the Chilean dictatorship um, secret army that is shooting in the United States that killed Orlando Letelier and has threatened other persons to make sure that democracy never is obtained in Chile again. And then we have SAVAK, S-A-V-A-K, the Iranian secret police known for their murder and torture that follows the Iranian students in the United States. And um, the anti-Castro Cubans, the bombing, seven bombings uh, were charged to one member of the anti-Castro group who claimed that he was trained for these bombings, like E. Howard Hunt. And there's a lot of violence got taking place in the Miami area of the CIA anti-Castro Cubans, many of them being wiped out now, four murders recently, and one of the gentlemen charged was acquitted. Links of the CIA and uh, Korean CIA to members of Congress influence over the Congress. So we have these refugee groups, Marina Oswald, through the white Russian community, the Solidaris, the DINA, D-I-N-A, the Chilean dictatorship, Savag from Iran, the anti-Castro Cubans, and the Korean CIA, which are five CIA organizations coming out of five groups of refugees that are bringing violence into the United States and causing bombings, murders, cars being blown up, and the murder of a president, uh, all of that being imported to this country to bring the violence to our continent. And, of course, Mr. Agnew has been charged with a $2 million lawsuit because of that tax-exempt foundation in Indiana, the um, CIA front that is linked to the Middle East, and he's breaking antitrust laws. I want to uh, just briefly mention that toxin, there's a new toxin called Rissom. It's not new, but Dr. Cyril Wecht and other doctors have come out with reports that the Legionnaire's disease not only isn't a disease, it's a poison toxin, and it left 179 people sick and 29 dead. And this identical toxin was tested at Fort Derrick, Maryland, and a doctor was in on the testing and making of Rissom, said that the symptoms up in Philadelphia are identical to the CIA toxins that it invaded the lungs and caused high temperature and uh, death. It wasn't an infection. Fred Nagel, the Secret Service agent that was involved 
with uh, supplying ammunition to a double murder in the Los Angeles area, um, got his charges dropped. I went into that case at length on Dialogue Conspiracy several months ago, and also the Secret Service agent to protect Stephen Ford, the son of the president, had a hand pistol machine gun taken from the trunk of the car while they were having dinner in a restaurant. It's the most sophisticated type of weapon made in Israel for shooting about 600 bullets in one minute. The man who shot the toy gun, it didn't shoot, he held a toy gun uh, to Ronald Reagan in Miami, Florida, was just charged with 10 years in prison. And the three people that were going to t kill Ted Kennedy were acquitted and all charges dropped. They, they were never brought to trial and they're not going to be, even though they did have weapons and mentioned somebody from New York and being paid $30,000 to kill Ted Kennedy. When that plan was blown, uh, all charges were dropped against them, but the man who had the toy gun for Regan got 10 years. That's just a preview of uh, some of the um, things mostly involving murder and assassination that have happened in the last week or so. Another one is a, a new um, allegation that the slasher murder, those are murders of people in Los Angeles from the uh, part of town Main Street and um, the drunken area, there's a slasher went around killing these old men that were sitting in alleys and the police files have been sold to a movie company in LA and there's a scandal on that. And there's random killings going on in San Francisco again, which you can expect because of Chief of Police Gaines, his work in Oakland with counterintelligence, and he became the chief in San Francisco. And there's a whole counterintelligence group that was behind the zebra and the Patty Hearst story. And now the random killings are taking place like the zebra killings, and San Francisco will again become a cause for violence and unsolved problems. These sniper killings are taking place right now. Uh, Buford Pucer, the man who made Walking Tall, uh, was murdered just on the eve of making a second movie. He he was an investigator who was uh, investigating illegal gambling, alcohol, prostitution in Tennessee, and he was killed in a car accident. And now his family have demanded that his body be exhumed, and they say that there's a drug called Cafergot, C-A-F-E-R-G-O-T, a poison, and that when he died on Route 64 in Tennessee that he had been drugged, and now the judge has allowed that this body be exhumed. It was called an automobile accident, and his family claimed that he was murdered. There's a series of murders up in the Detroit Police Department. The deputy chief of police was murdered. Now, suicide note, and uh, he, his co-worker was just taken off duty, Mr. Blount, because he's under investigation for illegal narcotics payoffs. But the man who suggested to be involved with the narcotics traffic was not killed, but his friend, the former chief of police, one of them was fired, and then one 21 years with the police department was just murdered. His name is Reginald Harvey. The CIA has been asked to explain the disappearance of an agent, Thomas Rhea, R-I-H-A, a professor at University of Colorado. He was a CIA agent. He hasn't been seen since March 15, 69. His wife wants to know where he is, whether to have him declared legally dead, and the uh, CIA won't tell him where she is. Reports this last week that the U.S. overacted in the Mayaguez incident. 41 people died, and the word to describe that slaughter is overacted. When Rockefeller lectures, people come up at him and yell at him and call him the Attica killer because uh, there was 43 were killed, and those were his orders for the National Guard to go in at Attica. And yet Gerald Ford is not called the Mayaguez killer or a killer of American soldiers. He had to show strength the minute he was appointed president by Richard Nixon, and the Mayaguez gave him this international strong on Russia um, stance. It was a PR job. And the overreaction, the only one who gained by that action was Gerald Ford because he looked as the new president after the problem with the impeachment of Richard Nixon that he was going to be tough on communism. And now all reports that were available for a long time say he overreacted. Well, so did um, Rockefeller overreact in Attica, and I think people should think of them uh, in the same way as murderers and make them account for um, their what we call nicely overreaction. And... The new Federal Trade Commission wants to ban any markings on organic food. 
they want to put a fine for labeling and they would allow additives and this is before Congress and maybe next week if I have time I'll give you the address of where to write uh, the assault against people who want healthy organic food without chemicals or dyes is taking place and they're trying to push through Congress the Federal Trade Commission a ban on any marking so that if you have pure orange juice or orange color or orange chemical the people that sell it aren't, will not be allowed to tell you what has chemicals in it and what doesn't and this again is a matter of life and death and they're removing the marking uh, just for making a dollar and uh, then some more people will suffer probably from cancer and food poisoning and the beat goes on uh, as I say I have a list here uh, those are just uh, I have 27 different uh, subjects that I could go at length in and it's very frustrating in this amount of time to not be able to do them each day or week. But I do want to go into a story now that is very, very important, and it's complicated. So maybe you want to take pencil and write down some of the dates or facts, and maybe you'll remember some of this, and if I don't finish it, I'll continue it next week. Um, on Thursday, September the 16th, 1976, W.P. Lawrence from the Washington Post wrote an article, the title was The Intelligent Advisor and the Green Book Affair. Now this has to do with Leo Chern, C-H-E-R-N-E. -E. In February 1976, following the Rockefeller um, Committee investigation or opening of some of illegal CIA activity in Washington, Gerald Ford answered the critics of the CIA by appointing what he called an oversight committee, which has as much oversight to it as he had with Leon Jaworski at the time of the Kennedy assassination on the Warren Report. And so he, he wanted to put people at rest that the CIA would have a watchdog, the fox watching the chicken house. So he appointed Leo Chern with a known history and long association already with the Central Intelligence Agency. Leo Chern is the head of the International Rescue Committee. IRC and long associated with CIA funds, CIA front money, and he was appointed the committee. Point, Ford appointed Chern six months after Leo Chern had lost a green book, a little green book with names and ratings of over 100 CIA intelligence agencies, agents and criticism or praise of them. And this list of 100 names could possibly include names of CIA agents that were involved in the kidnapping of Patty Hearst, such as Colston Westbrook, Willie Wolfe, Emily and William Harris, and other persons that were part of the SLA. The recipient of the little green book that Leo Chern lost, he lost it in Paris in 1975 on a very high intelligence meeting for about 10 days. The recipient of this little book uh, was Michael James Casey, who conveniently picked it up in Hong Kong or Bangkok. He says on a CIA airplane, he picked it up in Southeast Asia. Now, Michael James Casey doesn't explain, and neither does the article, how he got a passport, because his background prior to that was two years in Soledad prison, and he worked there just before uh, Donald DeFries got in there, but while uh, Mr. Brandt, a friend of Wendy Yoshimura's, was located in Soledad Prison. Michael James Casey was an ex-convict from Soledad. He was there, he was charged with two years of forgery and sent to Soledad. From there, he went to Boys Town, Nebraska, to clean out their files. Boys Town was under a scandalous investigation. They were charged with taking millions of dollars that were donated to these young boys for their benefit or whatever and using it for other purposes. And from uh, Soledad, Casey was sent up to Boys Town prior to um, the investigation of the scandal for what was called a special project, which is an interesting place to go after you are a known forger and you've been in Soledad prison for two years to be sent up to Boys Town is an interesting transition for whatever uh, you learn in prison. I understand you can learn plenty there to go on up to Boys Town. And they were under the height of a scandal, so they sent a person who had been charged for two years with forgery. Of course, I don't believe that the arrangement of Mr. Casey in Saladin was anything but a CIA assignment. And then he went on to Boys Town for what is called a special project, which was also probably a CIA assignment from there. 
And then after being in Boys Town and taking 31 papers that were involved in the scandal from Boys Town, he went to Hollywood and gave them to MGM to make a movie about Boys Town and then ends up in Southeast Asia and Vietnam with the International Rescue Committee. So that Michael James Casey, who uh, was in Soledad and Boys Town, began to work for the International Rescue Committee, the same organization that Leo Chern was the head of, and he was to be, uh, he worked on the Federal Intelligence International Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board that was formed by General Eisenhower, and then he was to become part of uh, Gerald Ford's Watchdog Committee. So Mr. Casey from Soledad Prison ends up in Southeast Asia. Now, from what I know about people in prison or my correspondence, it's very difficult to get a passport, and goodness knows it's hard to get the money to get to Southeast Asia, but Michael James Casey ended up over there with credentials from nothing less than Time magazine. Uh, and he had $15,000 to go over there spent by the Los Angeles Times. The International Rescue Committee uh, is known to all the researchers on the John Kennedy assassination. It was the organization that arranged to meet Maria, Marina Oswald and Lee Harvey Oswald when they came home from the Soviet Union in June of 1963, 62. Spas T. Rakin, Secretary General of the American Friends of the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc, which was part of the Rescue Committee, met Lee and Marina Oswald at the boat and took them right to the hotel. They didn't have to go through the regular customs. And Spas Rakin appears later in 1973 working for Richard Nixon, a committee fairness to Nixon against charges of the Watergate. Well, Michael Casey uh, brings the links to the Phoenix program, the Phoenix Southeast Asian program of Mr. William Colby uh, into the United States because when South Vietnam fell, he was directly in contact with security clearances to top people of the Phoenix program and help bring them to the United States down to Camp Pendleton in San Diego. So you see this Michael Casey is an interesting person. He had direct contact with Premier Key and other high Vietnamese officials and uh, he was working down at Camp Pendleton with them, and he had several trips to Southeast Asia, but was with agents of the Phoenix program when they left Southeast Asia the day it fell. At the same time, he was at telephone contact with Randolph Hearst at his New York telephone number, and he was giving them important information about Patty Hearst and identifying her through things that nobody else would know unless they knew where Patty Hearst was. And according to the Washington Post, uh, Michael Casey was in charge with Judge Carter of the Patty Hearst case. Now, his links to Leo Chern of the Intelligence Committee and the Kaplan Foundation, the CIA fronts, and the Phoenix Program suggests now, uh, when I see that he was in charge with Judge Carter, why William and Emily Harris were never charged with bank robbery when Patty Hearst was charged, uh, why Judge Carter died just before sentencing, Patty Hearst, and also why many, many people were not charged with assisting taking Patty around the country from the time they left Los Angeles. They still haven't been charged with harboring a criminal. Now, there's media suppression of this article about Casey and Leo Chern. The Washington Post carried this article on September the 16th, but the New York Times carried the article the same day. Only they said the U.S. investigating the loss of a notebook containing national security data. And I'll go into what the New York Times said on this, but they deleted every single mention of the SLA in the New York Times article. The Washington Post had it, but the New York Times didn't. And one reason the New York Times didn't have it is that the name of one of their reporters was in this little black green book, not the black book, the little green book, a New York Times reporter and Mr. Michael Casey and Leo Chern's names were in this notebook of 100 CIA agents that was, in quotes, lost in Paris, was then found on a CIA airplane in South Vietnam going to Bangkok or Hong Kong, was delivered. Michael Casey called the CIA and Leo Chern in August, July of 75 and said, I have your little book. But how it got from Paris to Southeast Asia is not told in either of these articles, and there is this big news blackout about the story. 
Well, the Washington Post goes on to say that Leo Chern is one of Gerald Ford's chief intelligence advisor. He's a central figure now in the Justice Department investigating what is known as a Green Book affair. The Green Book was a government notepad. It had records and briefings of diplomatic and intelligence officers of the trip made in March 75. You remember uh, chronologically Patty Hearst was kidnapped in February 74. The shootout of the SWAT team where six were burned was in May of 1974. Patty Hearst and Mickey and Jack Scott traveled until the fall of 75, just a month after this book was returned to the CIA, to Leo Chern by Michael Casey. The Harrises and Patty Hearst were brought in. It was the spring when the book was taken, and he held it in July, returned it in August, and then the Harrises and Patty were, in quotes, discovered in September. This notebook contained classified information injurious to the national security of the United States. And Chern, with his CIA connections, had two posts. As I say, President uh, for, is on the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board and then appointed after he lost the book and after it was returned to the Intelligence Oversight Board. Leo Chern was traveling when the book was lost with his aide, a Commander Lionel Omar, 19 years in Navy uh, intelligence, described by all of his associates as extremely meticulous, professional, experienced in handling classified material. Now, uh, he didn't notice that the little green book was missing, he claims, until he came home in Maryland and it was missing, but he saw it up till 30 minutes when they left Paris, and then it found its way to South Vietnam to the CIA, a continuance of a CIA operation, and to San Diego, and was used with Judge Carter and law enforcement people in California. Uh, I'm going back to the Washington Post article in a minute, but I do want to quote something from my Realist article that I wrote in June and July 1974, titled, The SLA is the CIA, and this was written just one year before Leo Chern went to Paris and lost the book of the top agents, and before Michael Casey, uh, with links to the CIA, picked it up in Hong Kong. In The Realist, I wrote on page 7, it's under the biography of Emily Harris, I said, when the Harris's apartment was vacated in the Oakland area, after Patty was kidnapped, among the names left in the address book was Tim Casey from Orange County. Emily dated Tim Casey during the summer of 67 and 68 while she worked at Disneyland Hotel in California. Disneyland Hotel was the location of uh, uh, Ronald Ziegler, incidentally, who then became, he worked at Disneyland at the Jungle Boat Rides, who became the press secretary for Richard Nixon. But Disneyland Hotel and the Los Angeles Police Department that were both behind, um, that had some involvement in this SLA saga, have one Thing in common, or many things in common, specifically the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency, the same agency that gave us Robert Haldeman and Dwight Chapin and Richard Nixon and the chiefs of the White House plumbers. And I asked in this article in 1974, was Emily Harris in touch with espionage agents from California, from specifically Orange County? <clears throat> I asked that in 1974 after the shootout in Los Angeles in May, and I didn't know where they fled because nobody knew until the fall of 75 where Emily and William Harris were, or Patty Hearst. And then after they were captured in 1975, it turned out that they had indeed gone directly from the uh, Los Angeles area to Disneyland where they stayed 10 days. They were at Disneyland for 10 days. And that Emily Harris uh, later uh, acknowledged she was at Disneyland, and I asked in 1974, did she know anybody by the name of Kim Casey? Now, what I don't know now yet, or we have to find out through private investigators, I'm sure not law enforcement, is Michael James Casey, the same Casey that was involved with the Phoenix program in South Vietnam and with Camp Pendleton and with the International Rescue Committee and uh, the Operation Southeast Asia where Colston Westbrook came that formed the SLA. Is Michael James Casey any relative or the same person as Tim Casey who knew Emily Harris in 68, 67? 
Another coincidence of Casey, which isn't uh, much of a coincidence because, again, it has to be checked out, is that when Emily and William Harris were arrested in San Francisco, they were at one house, and Wendy Yoshimura and Patty Hearst lived at another house. And the home that Patty was at on Moore Street was owned and rented by a man from the San Francisco Police Department that had worked in the identification division for about 19 years. But the police officer that went to the house that brought Patty Hearst into jail, uh, his name was Tim Casey. The same name is the person that I wrote about in 1974 that Emily Harris knew. Tim Casey is from the San Francisco Police Department. He went to the apartment of Patty Hearst. I'm reading an AP Wire story dated 9-20-1975. September the 20th, 1975, in which Tim Casey went to the apartment and was looking in the window, and Wendy Yoshimura looked through the window and saw him at the Moore Street apartment, owned and rented by San Francisco police agent, and she opened the door, and Patty Hearst said, don't shoot, I'll go with you, and Tim Casey, the San Francisco police officer, took them away, and that ended the 592-day search. Well, I just wonder, because Theral Wheeler, who was named in the SLA story, had a brother that worked for the San Francisco Police Department, and I mentioned the fact that the getaway car for the Hibernia Bank was parked in front of a house that used to belong to the chief of the San Francisco Police Department. So is Tim Casey any relative of the notebook that Emily William Harris had and Michael James Casey links to the Phoenix program that Colston Westbrook had in Southeast Asia and his trips to Southeast Asia? These cases we have to go into further. But back to the Washington Post story of the Little Green Book. Uh, When it was lost in Europe in March of 1975, they immediately called um, Mr. Wheaton Byers, Executive Secretary of the Foreign Foreign Intelligence Board, and said, our notebook is missing. They searched the aircraft cabin, and that mystery wasn't solved until July 24th. The Little Green Book was located. And Michael James Casey said, I have your notebook. Casey um, held the notebook. He made some copies of part of it, which I think is bartering for certain people from the SLA. And unless we have the names of those 100 people, which should be made public, it won't, of course, because national security was involved. Um, We won't know how many SLA names or if any were on uh, the possession of Mr. Casey, but How he got the book, as I say, has not been explained yet. Uh, Casey's background with the CIA and the refugees, the International Rescue Committee, goes back to his resettlement of Vietnamese refugees. And he also asked to appear as a witness for Patty Hearst at her trial, the bank robbery. And he had worked for the CIA-funded International Rescue Committee, but he was not allowed to testify on Patty's behalf. Leo Chern notified the intelligence staff When his book was found, they told him to play it down, not make any fuss of it, and this probably explains why the Associated Press and the United Press haven't carried any major story on this, even though uh, there was one single article in the Washington Post on the 16th and one in the New York Times, and it's other than that, there's no wire services uh, investigation of of any kind or even a story going across the country. Now, the intelligence community acted as if the book wasn't too important, and after it was returned August the 26th, Leo Chern said that he asked William Michael Casey, or Michael Casey to uh, resign from his International Rescue Committee. Well, he had done everything he had to do. He had credentials from Time Magazine to go to Southeast Asia in April, May, and June. He was paid $15,000 by the Los Angeles Times for a trip to Hong Kong and Bangkok, the excuse being to find Patty Hirsch, but it also could be making CIA connections. Uh, this former convict from Soledad was flown over. He had top-secret security clearances at Camp Pendleton. So when he was fired in August 74 from the International Rescue Committee, he didn't have much else to do. He had brought this important book home, and the Vietnamese Phoenix operators were here, and so uh, Leo Chern fired him from his committee, But I'm sure with his knowledge of these hundred names in national security that Mr. Casey didn't have any trouble finding his next job. In September of 1975, after Patty Hearst was found and a judge was assigned to the case, he was in charge with Judge Carter. But shortly uh, 
after that, I, evidently he didn't have too much to do with the trial, or we'll never know if he was in contact with D.A. Browning in the San Francisco area. In February 76, months after Chern lost his book, he was appointed to the Intelligence Oversight Committee. It's interesting that the little green book shows up in San Diego. It was told uh, to Robert Dietrich, a reporter for the San Diego Evening Tribune, and he claims that Casey showed him the contents of his book. Because Mr. Dietrich isn't any hot water and neither is Casey, it obviously was to continue the CIA operations in the San Diego area or to use it for whatever purposes they wanted. And the San Diego area is important to the SLA story. That's where the script for the SLA was written, that book called Black Abductor that was issued from a non-existent publisher in 1972 and a non-existent author, Harrison James. And uh, in San Diego is where Mickey and Jack Scott were living at the time that Patty Hearst was arrested and they were staying down in San Diego. The book had briefings with the embassies, the CIA agencies. It had reaction of news stories to the CIA. It told about unemployment and inflation in European countries. And also it named the New York Times reporter Terry Robards. Now the name Terry Robards was in this little green book. And I think it's interesting that the New York Times is protecting the links of the little green book to the SLA story by not uh, making those connections at all, even though they must have gotten their same information from the Washington Post. Now, there's some important questions about Leo Chern and the little green book. How did it get from, uh, say, the Oval Offices, the top CIA offices, Leo Chern was sent on this trip to Europe by none other than Henry Kissinger and the highest officials in the intelligence community. Uh, how did this book get in the hands of a former convict from Soledad who's on a CIA airplane in Southeast Asia? The second point is how did Mr. Casey get from Soledad prison up to Boys Town for what was called a special project and then with a movie producer, a TV producer, MGM, and then he gets a passport to go overseas and a list of credentials from Time Magazine and Top Secret Security Passes. And then another point is, what was his interest in the Patty Hearst trial? Because uh, as of today, Emily William Harris were never charged with robbing the Hibernia Bank that uh, Patty had to stand charges alone. Uh, Stephen Kilgore was never brought in or charged with harboring any criminals. Stephen Celia was dropped of all charges at the bank, Carmichael Bank, and not brought in for perjury about his presence the day of the bank robbery and or the formation of a double that was there. Celia was uh, not charged with that or for taking Patty Hearst. He took her from Sacramento and got her in this apartment in New York, and he wasn't charged with um, taking her or harboring her there. And his father had close links with the FBI and had told them where the SLA were in San Francisco. And Mickey and Jack Scott were never charged with taking Patty Hearst from the Bay Area to Pennsylvania or New York and back to Pennsylvania. And Mr. and Mrs. Scott, Jack Scott's parents, drove Patty Hearst from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, to the East Coast, and they were never charged with harboring a criminal. And Jack Weiner, W-E-I-N-E-R, in Philadelphia, and Philip Shinnick of New Jersey have uh, been called before a grand jury to explain their fingerprints in the house in Pennsylvania where Patty stayed, and they refused to answer, and they subpoenaed Clarence Kelly as their defense to say the involvement of the FBI and the SLA. Uh, when Yamoil Shamira starts trial tomorrow on um, some possession of firearms that took place several years ago in the Berkeley area, and I just read that Wendy sold a painting, an art object, for $5,000 just several months ago in 1976 to the internal uh, revenue for a building decoration. It's a painting that's hanging in the third floor in Santa Ana in the IRS. So the taxpayers are putting this former uh, escapee, escape artist, uh, they're hanging her art in the federal building, no less, of the internal revenue. I think that... Uh, there should be some wondering about who's buying the art. Not that I don't believe in supporting uh, people that have been in prison or on the lam, but Wendy Yoshimir was also paid another 5000 or so to watch Patty Hearst in the house in Pennsylvania 
as her babysitters and her links to the um, right-wing intelligence community are very obvious, and none of these people have really been charged for any of these crimes. So I think that little uh, green book of Mr. Churn worked very well in the SLA case, and as I say, Emily and William Harris were not charged for robbing the Hibernia Bank with Patty Hearst and Judge Carter died on the bench before sentencing Patty. So you can see that many, many people are getting off um, of this, even the woman who perjured herself who was uh, taking Stephen Celia to uh, the Carmichael Bank and visited Folsom Prison just a few miles away the day that the bank was robbed and a woman was killed. She was not charged with perjury at the trial about her presence that day. So the little green book contained a hundred or more CIA agents. The details fell in the hands of Michael James Casey, and it had to do with the highest security of the United States, and also Michael Casey has ties to the American underground. Now, the Washington Post says he has ties to the American underground, but they don't make the connection of the SLA being the CIA or that he could further the assistance of provocateurs who want to infiltrate and disguise himself as a left. Robert Dietrich, this reporter from San Diego, raised many questions in his article in the San Diego Evening Tribune when first reports came out, and uh, the first report said that Leo Chern had left the Little Green Book in a whorehouse in a European city, which doesn't explain still how it got to Southeast Asia on a CIA airplane and uh, could influence the trial or the prosecution or the non-prosecution of people involved in the SLA CIA operation. Uh, the whorehouse story sounds pretty good because a few weeks ago I mentioned on KLRB how a man who has done assassinations for the CIA called me and offered me some information and had told me that the way that murders and assassinations came down came from the National Security Council in Washington to a professor in Salt Lake City at the Brigham Young University and then to Chicago where there are so-called whorehouses that are really CIA operations. And it's at these places where an agent calls up and asks for a certain woman like Emily or or Nancy or whatever, and if she's not there, he has no assignment. And if she's there, uh, the code and the direction tell him where to go for his next hit or kill. So the horror house and the CIA um, are good places to leave messages or to get assignments. And when the reporter from San Diego Evening Tribune said that the Green Book was left at a whorehouse in a European city. He probably meant a CIA agency because that's what they call uh, the places where they do pick up their assignments. Well, the security priority of the notebook was very great. The CIA was concerned. The Washington Post says they substantially upgraded the CIA's Office of Security. The Post went on. The Justice Department has now said that a, an investigation is on the way. Well, you know the investigation can't get any further into the SLA angles because the Justice Department was involved in uh, not finding the real culprits behind the kidnapping of Patty Hearst with allowing them to get free, with allowing those six to be murdered in Los Angeles. It was all part of the COINTEL program that's linked to D.A. Browning in San Francisco, Nixon's appointee who refused to prosecute Emily William Harris along with Patty. And Donald Gray of the FBI, he teaches at the academy back there in Virginia, and he personally killed Donald DeFries at close range before the LAPD burned him. He's the nephew of former acting director Pat Gray of the FBI. And then Charles Bates of the FBI, uh, who was in Chicago at the time of the COINTEL program where Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed, later went on to Washington and helped, in quote, investigate Watergate, and he became the great cover-up artist in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I really doubt with these links of the DA and the FBI and the prosecutor and the academies that um, the Justice Department is going to get very far in investigating the Little Green Book. It's leverage, and it was leverage, and it involved the national security of the United States, and it explains why all those people I listed have not been prosecuted or charged with crimes and never will be, and if they do, would be very slight. Now, Lionel Olmers, who works with Leo Chern, is highest level intelligence of Navy intelligence. He's skilled in cryptic shorthand. He was never asked to decode the messages that he took by the CIA security officials that were in the book, 
and yet they were translated. And uh, he swears even, this is a quote, even when I went to the men's room during the trip, I took the notebook out of my attache case and carried it with me. So somewhere uh, from the time he saw it 30 minutes before they left Paris until he boarded a TWA plane and came back to Washington, D.C. and unpacked in Maryland and noticed the green book was missing. Um, we have one more minute, and I did want to go into the New York Times version of Leo Chern and also uh, the intelligence links of Leo Chern from the International Rescue Committee and a Los Angeles Times article about Casey's trips, uh, his knowledge about my lie, how he could implicate General Westmoreland and the high Pentagon figures. He was high up with information and blackmail with the military and the Phoenix program. I may continue it next week. Um, I have been asked and getting calls and letters to talk about uh, Jimmy Carter, and I may, on Dialogue Conspiracy, take a break and do Carter and Ford for whatever it's worth, my opinion, of the two men, because the elections will be coming up in a week or two, and then the week after this, get back to um, Leo Chern and the SLA and the intelligence community. But Our time is out for today. This is Dialogue Conspiracy. So I'll see you next week, or be speaking with you next week, and we'll continue with the scandals and murders coming out of Washington, D.C. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for many years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. <laughs>